Welcome everybody to General Grand Council Presents. Today we are honored to have most worshipful brother Robert Davis, Grand Master of Masons in Oklahoma. So without further ado, I'm just going to go ahead and let him take over. Well, thank you, Steve, and uh, uh, good afternoon, uh, my companions. I hope all is well and in your environs. I can tell you that I'm one month away from being out of office as the Grand Master of, of my jurisdiction. And I'm so busy right now that um, um, I'm not sure what I've put together for you today is, 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 uh, is, is what I would have uh, uh, liked to have done if I'd had a little more time, but I hopefully it will make the um, the point that I that I wanted to make, and and the topic is a journey of a man living in the image of God, and uh, and it relates to an epiphany that I had about one o'clock in the morning a couple of nights ago, and and whenever I tell uh, Clyde Schoolfield that I've had an epiphany, he says, "Uh oh," <laughs> and uh, so. He's probably, that's why he's listening in today. But, but anyway, we'll start this out uh, talking about um, the, uh, the crucifixion and, and sort of uh, the resurrection story. And in the year 1613, the English clergyman and metaphysical poet, John Doon, wrote one of the most profound poems about the crucifixion of Christ I've ever read. And he's not an easy poet to follow. So rather than read the poem, poem, just let me kind of set it up for you. And the poem was entitled, Good Friday, 1613, Riding Westward. And of course, we are referring to the Friday before Easter, commencing Christ's death on the cross. Sometime on April the 2nd, 1613, Dune was riding from London westward to Exeter in Wales. He undoubtedly was feeling a, a lot of shame and guilt for being on the road instead of being in church, as his church, the Church of England, taught that Good Friday was a day to do nothing but be in remembrance of the Savior's suffering and death men were to withdraw from any worldly affairs of that day and even abstain from food until Easter Sunday. After all, by taking on a human form and by innocently dying a terrible death on the cross, God's son was believed to have paid for the sins of all mankind, so to have released Adam and Eve and their offspring through the ages from an eternal punishment. By believing in the Son, then, his followers obtained salvation. But Dune was riding westward on a road instead of a church on that particular Good Friday. He limits his journey. To ride westward, westward in Dune's time implied a journey to London's west side where thieves and murderers were hanged publicly. Also, traditionally, because the sun set in the west, it was associated with dying. So in 21 couplets, Doan is writing an apologia for his faithless act. He observes the stars at night move uniformly from east to west, from where Christ the Son of God took on humanity, from where he died on the cross at Golgotha. Doan was cite, then cites the Bible explaining then that to look on God face to face is death to any creature. He averts his eyes because he dare not look. Another couplet out of pity, Doan says he cannot bear to witness Mary's suffering, the mother of Christ. He affirms that he ob observes the suffering of Christ and Mary in his mind's eye, in his memory. And last, he explains that by turning his back on Christ, that is traveling westward, he also submits himself as a guilty creature who, uh, who deserves God's angry punishment and purification. So to pick up on the last part of the poem, I hope I can communicate something of the power of the crucifixion image in Dune's words. 
Who sees God's face must die. What a death were it then to see God die. It made his own lieutenant nature think or shrink. It made his footstool crack and the sun to wink. Could I behold those hands which span the holes and pierced with, which span the poles and pierced with holes, or that blood, which is the seat of all our souls, if not of his, made dirt of dust, or that flesh which was worn by God for his apparel, ragged and torn? If on these things I dare not look, or dare I, on his distressed mother's cast mine eye, who was God's partner here, and furnished thus half of that sacrifice which ransomed us? Though these things as I ride be from mine eye, they're present yet unto my memory, for that looks towards them, and thou looks toward me. O Savior, as thou hangest upon the tree, I turn my back to thee, but to receive corrections till thy mercies bid me leave. O think me worth thine anger, punish me, burn me off, burn off my rust and my deformity, restore thine image so much that thou may know me, and I will turn my face to thee. So in this poem, filled with icons and complex imagery, Dune is really showing us how, guilt, how a guilty person thinks. His poignant self-analysis also reflects the truthfulness of the human condition. The sinful creature, from Adam and Eve through their descending generations, hides its face from its maker, ashamed of its deformity. But once redeemed by grace, Dune says, I will turn my face, knowing what happens to a man who sees God's face. These were not just empty words. So in Freemasonry, we contemplate this mystery in the context of the resurrection story of our hero Hiram. And as a result of the fall of Adam, we must be resurrected time and again in our own worldly way each time awakening into a more perfect understanding of the nature of God. In the presence of, of our being reborn in this life, we are also hastening to our own death. Will we be ready to turn and face our God on that fateful day with no shame or guilt, but as one who then, and only then, will be a truly initiated man? There is this strongly suggestive line given the candidate before he first enters the lodge, that he's going to embark on a journey that he, to he is told is nothing less than that last great change, your transition from time to eternity. And then in the second section of the master's degree, he's told by the senior deacon using yet another scripture reading to contemplate the resurrection. The master tells him he's about to experience the closing events of human life, the death, burial, and resurrection. But it is all allegory. We are dealing here with a different kind of resurrection. In the case of our candidate, his death is intended to be symbolic of another kind of death. His rebirth is an entirely different thing. He is reborn into his own life. He has symbolically passed through, through another kind of striking and dramatic change, a rebirth or regeneration of his whole nature as a man. The death to which Freemasonry alludes is the death in life of man's old self. It is over the grave of a man's lower nature that he must walk before he can attain the real heights of his worthiness. He is resurrected to higher life within himself. And what this means is that when our self-sacrifice is great enough, when our consciousness has been awakened enough, when we are capable of taking on an, an entirely new quality of life, to endow our psyche with a ceremonial form of a more perfected man, this is the profound nature of the Masonic journey. And that is the work before us. It is the labor of our lifetime. To us, this is the meaning of the resurrection of Hiram. 
And this is the nature of the inner quest of the degrees of the chapter and council in the York Rise. It is a quest of both ascending to higher states of consciousness while descending to the depths of our being to come to understand the nature of God within us. It is a preparation for the ultimate of ultimately turning our face toward God. It is the quest of the individual for self-awareness and transcendence. In the earliest biblical tradition, we find Jacob's dream of a ladder set up, set up on the ground and at its top reached heaven and the angels of God were ascending and descending upon it. In the earliest tradition of the royal arch, Enoch, the Hebrew patriarch of perfect nature, sees himself in a dream being lured vertically through nine arches into an underground vault containing a triangular gold plate on which the true name of God is engraved. In the English tradition, it is a word which is found on a double cubicle altar. In the York Rite version, the word is found on the Ark of the Covenant. The passing mention of these replicas is inc incidental to the story. The point of the story is that the discovery of a great secret within the vault of the old temple by means of which the true word is rediscovered and the wisdom of the generations restored. And all of this is intended to have a deeply symbolic meaning in the psyche of the individual. The purpose is for the aspirant to discover his own true nature and his connection with nature or the universe or the divine. Now, a modern expression of this truth is in the play, The Tree Witch by Peter uh, Virick. The main character is searching for his identity and the dryad, which is a, a symbol of nature in that play says, to find us excavate yourself not Greece. In your own skull, nine egos deep, lies Troy. And in the Bible, Paul says, know ye not that you are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. And Joseph Campbell, considered to be by many the, 20, the 20th century leading expert on mythology and comparative religion, remarked that the quest of the hero can almost always be understood as a descent into his own mind to discover his true nature and identity. And so this idea of ascending and descending is represented in the Blue Lodge by the circumambulations. It is referred to in the Mark Master degree by the journey of the fellow craft in search of himself. In the most excellent master degree, the circumambulations lead him from the terrestrial world to the celestial world where he will place the keystone of his work when he faces God. And upon this peculiar stone is written a name which will join him with the Godhead. And in a second journey, the Ark of the Covenant is brought in and safely seated. And here we find God filling the temple with glory uh, by the breath of life and thus sanctifying man as a spiritual being, completing the six days of creation again. And in the Royal Arch, we find the journey being from east to west again, where the candidate must once more return to the rubbish of the fallen temple to be humbled before he can be exalted. It is a descent into destruction to find that which is indestructible. In the Royal Master degree, we learn that that which is lost can only be found by a descent. And in the work of the Select Master degree, it is done in a subterranean vault. Yet every descent in masonry has a corresponding, corresponding ascent represented by a movement upward or by a horizontal movement in emerging from a cave or a tunnel. It symbolizes change in levels of consciousness, increasing awareness, and ultimately a knowing of the deity in a way which can only be experienced within oneself. It is a transcendent, ineffable, and individual thing. And it is sometimes known as the mystic experience. The bottom line is that an inside of each man's self journey is necessary before the experience of transcendence is possible. 
And the thing to be gained on this journey into yourself is insight, intuition, revelation, and gnosis. And this is why it's a personal quest. Knowledge can be gained from books or from a teacher, but insight and revelation must be the result of an individual's confrontation and exploration of his own nature with that of God and the universe. It is the journey of man confronting his own identity with God. The goal is to be able to say with Judas Maccabeus, I feel the deity within. It is the greatest quest a man can undertake. And let us never forget the profound insight we received when passing the sixth pillar of the Royal Arch Knight Templar Priest. He who conquers, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God, and I will write on him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, and the new Jerusalem which comes down from my God out of heaven, and my own new name. My companions, perhaps the journey of a man living in the image of God is to discover his own ineffable name to be given him when he turns his face to God. And that's, the, uh, that's my meditation for today.